Jeffrey, thank you for being such a dear and watching Rex while I'm away. I've included a simple list of instructions for you to make this easier. I hope he doesn't give you too much trouble. Rex likes to sleep in the guest room on normal days, and typically won't come out until around lunchtime. It's best to not bother him until then anyway. You'll find his food dish and water dish above the stove in the pantry. Give him one scoop of wet food, found in the fridge, and one scoop of dry, above the washing machine. Water bowl should be cleaned after every use and only use sink water with the Brita filter, please. Rex prefers the dark. Please don't turn on any lights in the house while you stay here. Sometimes he gets a little feisty in his old age. It's best to ignore him when that happens. If there's bad weather, please lock him in the laundry as he gets very anxious. If he needs to exercise or go for a walk, remember to go at night so he isn't bothered by noise or neighbors. The leash and collar are under the sink. He loves to watch the TV show Dexter and Fuller House. Money for yourself is on the table, and keep the house keys on your person at all times. See you on Thursday. Thanks, Miss Lofton. Side jobs are always odd ones, aren't they? I got the gig from a co-worker right before the Christmas break when I said I needed some extra cash, you know, something quick to buy some last-minute gifts. They had known the Loftons for years, and ever since her husband passed away, my co-worker told me that she takes a trip this time of year to avoid feeling sad. But that dog is her best friend, so naturally, she wants the best care while she's gone. After putting in a good word for me, I was contacted with the instructions I transcribed above via the email. A second secure message told me where the house was located. It wasn't a big house, but typical for the neighborhood. The big fenced-in yard with a beware of dog sign attached made me almost reconsider. My co-worker said when he did this job last year, he'd never even seen the dog at all. So, why did I feel like I was being watched as I crossed the yard to the wraparound porch? The house keys were in the mailbox, just like the secure message told me. I could hear the TV playing as I unlatched the door. I could see immediately Mrs. Lofton wasn't kidding when she said that she kept her house dark. All the windows were curtained and the blinds drawn. It was hard to see really much of anything in the front room foyer except the desk where she kept her mail piled up. Closing the door back, I used my smartphone to light the way into the den, listening for Rex to come tearing through the house at the sound of an intruder. It felt very weird to me to sit in a dark den in a stranger's house and be completely alone. Guess this is what I signed up for, I muttered to myself, as I saw the dog's dish not far from the entrance of the den. It was already empty, which I guess meant that he had already eaten whatever she gave him before she left on a trip. I decided to go ahead and fill it up with the prescribed food, walking down the hall to the laundry. Big mistake, really. When I passed by the guest room, I saw the silhouette of the dog laying there on the floor, and I paused uncomfortably. I mean, I'm a dog person. I have two dogs at home, so... Why did this old husky make me feel uneasy? I couldn't put my finger on it. But decided to try and be friendly anyway. Hey there, boy. I'm Jeff, I told him. The dog did not respond. I whistled to try and elicit a response, but still got nothing, so I just kept on walking to the laundry. As I reached for the dry food, I heard the low guttural noise from behind, Rex just making himself known. I told myself as I got the scoop and then walked back to the den, I'm making you some supper. Want it now? I muttered. This time, I didn't pause to look at the dog. When I finished mixing the two types of food together, I shifted the bowl around to make noise and try to get Rex to come eat, but no dice. Guess you really do want to stick to your schedule, I said, as I checked my phone. Something told me these five days were either going to be long and boring, or filled with unease. I didn't like either option, really. I settled down in her wingbag recliner, and I got on my phone. Of course, the internet was shitty. I shouldn't have expected anything different, but I just scrolled through my Instagram feed and Snapchats, trying to pass the time until Rex made himself known. Every now and then, I would glance up at the hallway, which led to the guest room, hoping to see the husky romp out tiredly, only half glancing because, well, it was dark. For a second, I thought I heard something, and I waved my phone flashlight towards the hall. For that split moment, I thought I saw Rex standing up on his hind legs. Shit, 
I fumbled with my phone and tried to get a better look. Nothing was there. I decided that freaky moment was the time to confront this dog. Maybe if I spent a little time with Rex, he wouldn't seem so scary to me. Walking to the next room, I used my phone's flashlight again and got a good look at Rex. There was... nothing super special about the hound. He looked like he was half asleep, blind in one eye, and snoring and shaking a little on the side of the bed. Actually, it looked like he was chewing on something. I realized this as I took a closer step. The dog made a low growl, wanting me to stay back, but curiosity got the better of me, and I took the chance. It was a big rat, half rotted away and stuck between the hound's teeth, and its paws. The thing looked like it had fought against Rex valiantly, but ultimately lost. I took a step back into the hallway and tried not to panic. Was the dog able to eat a rat? I googled it and paced the kitchen, praying the internet would hurry up and give me an answer before the old dog wound up choking on his tiny bones. It is instinctive for cats and dogs to pursue small prey, such as rodents and birds. In some cases, pets simply pursue and kill the prey. In other cases, the prey animal is consumed by pets. Can't tell you how relieved I was to read that answer. I didn't like the idea of the dog chewing on a rat, even if it was instinct. Rats carry disease, and if Mrs. Lofton takes him to the vet a month from now, she'll know what happened. I decided to try and goad Rex with his leash and collar for a walk. Come on, boy. Let's go for a walk around the block, I told him. The hound immediately stood up and stretched, whining irritably as he trotted towards me. That's a good boy. You aren't so bad, are you? I said, carefully placing the collar on him. He kept making low noises. Couldn't tell if it was because he was uneasy around me or because he was still swallowing the last of that rat. Once the collar and leash were on, I tugged him to the front door. Mrs. Lofton has you on a tight schedule, but maybe we can shake things up, I suggested as he headed toward the street. Rex was hesitantly sniffing the ground and meandering down the street like a normal dog. And for a brief moment, I was sure that everything would turn out fine. Then one of the neighbors jogged by and Rex pulled me like a freight train, barking as his floppy ears jostled from side to side. The woman let out a soft cry of alarm and I tried to calm her as I pulled Rex, but I wasn't listening. He was reacting like any good watchdog I was ready to attack. Just eh, ignore him, he's old, I said, straining to pull him toward me. Rex turned and bit at my hand. I lost grip of his leash. In a heartbeat, he was down the street yelping and barking. The neighbors had jumped out of the way and was long gone. But if I didn't hurry, Rex would be too. Stupid dog, I muttered as I got up and followed after him. I knew he would have to give up eventually. About ten minutes later, that was exactly what happened, and I grabbed the leash and yanked Rex towards me. Cuh. Consider this the last walk you'll get for five days, I muttered as I marched back to Mrs. Lofton's house. The hound tried to pull against me, but I was firm. He felt a little bad for him, but I wasn't about to lose him in another frantic race. Once inside, I let him free and latched the door back collapsing on the kitchen floor and tossing the house keys on the table. That was exhausting, I thought to myself as I watched him run to his water bowl. You're more of a handful than I bargained for, bud, I muttered as I went over and took off his leash. The dog stood stiff as if he was about to bite me again, and he growled in response. Yeah, yeah, I'll bark no bite, I said, as I sunk back down into the recliner. I just wanted to relax for a few minutes. Maybe get a power nap. But Rex had other ideas. Just as my eyelids got heavy and I was drifting to dreamland, the husky let out a low bark that nearly made me jump to the ceiling. He sat there staring at me dead-eyed as I was in the recliner. What do you want? I asked. He barked loud again, and I realized he wanted the chair. Fine, sure, it's your house, I said as he climbed in the recliner at the moment I got out of it. You watch your programs, I'm going to get some sleep, I told the dog dismissively. I kept it on Netflix and walked to the guest room, collapsing on the bed. That race across the neighborhood had drained me, and it was only day one. Closing my eyes, I kept thinking that Rex was going to come to the room and demand something with more sharp barks. Maybe it was my tired brain, but I felt certain that dog did come in the room and climb on my chest. I kept feeling this heavy pressure against my torso, and I kept fading in and out of being asleep his dead eyes staring at me when I was awake. This dog was pushing my buttons. 
When I did wake up, I found Rex was still in the recliner, sitting almost like a person would as he watched his TV. Up you cozy, I told him, as I walked over to the fridge to see what Mrs. Lofton had left me to eat. I'm not sure why I didn't notice it before, but when I opened the door this time and looked at the shelves, I realized the only things that weren't for Rex were a block of cheese and some prescription meds. Jesus, you really are spoiled, I said aloud as I closed the fridge back. I walked over to the table to grab the house keys, only to realize they were no longer there. Crap, they must have fallen off when I tossed them. I realized as I checked the grimy floor. Again, my phone was the only illumination as I crawled under the table and tried to see where they might have fallen. Just as I scanned the light towards the den, I saw the silhouette of Rex again in a frozen place. This time, there was no mistaking it. He was walking on his back legs to the guest room. What the hell? I scrambled up from the floor and pointed the light at him. Here, boy, I told the dog. He turned to look at me, still somehow standing upright like it was perfectly normal and didn't blink. Then he dropped back down to four legs and trotted into the guest room, somehow kicking the door closed and leaving me alone at the conundrum. I just need some air, I told myself as I searched for the keys. That was when I saw him, hanging above the stove. How did they get there? Had Rex put them there? No, that was that was impossible. I was just about to reach for them when my phone rang. It's Lofton. Hey, perfect timing. I, I had a question for you. Before I could even talk, she interrupted with a request for a dog. I did my best to not roll my eyes. Sure, what is it? She told me that he would need his favorite toy, and that she kept that toy in the basement near the water heater. The basement. Past the laundry, right? I got it. I said, turning and walking down the steps carefully. I had her on speakerphone as I commented, Ms. Lofton, has anyone ever told you how weird Rex is? It wasn't hard to miss the toy. It looked like a cabbage patch doll. Has he been good for you? Mrs. Lofton also asked as I reached down and grabbed the doll. That's one way of putting it. He enjoyed his walk earlier, I commented. As soon as I said it, I regretted telling her because it went against her rigorous instructions. It was fine, I reassured her. I turned to go back up the stairs and I heard the soft slam. I felt my heart drop. L let me call you back, I said, as I was now in pitch darkness. Somehow the basement door had closed on me. No worries, just had to get up the steps. Then I reached for the handle, and just as I was going to open it, I heard it snap and lock. Then I heard a low growl. Rex? How did the fucking dog lock me in the basement? Hey! Hey, listen to me. This isn't funny. Let me out, I said as I banged on the door. Only the low growl responded. This was insane. I sighed and turned back towards the basement, using my phone to get a good look around. Maybe I can get out of here some other way. I carefully climbed down the stairs, nearly tripping over more of Rex's toys. And then I went towards the back wall to see if there was some kind of hidden chute or something. But nothing was visible, except for crates of dog food. Jesus, this dog eats more than I do. I said as I checked it. Most of it was expired. There's no wonder Rex seemed so sickly. I slumped on the floor, feeling defeated and tired. If the dog wanted to lock me down here, so be it. I could deal with that for a few days. Probably piss on the floor, eat dog food to survive. I wasn't sure what I was going to do about water, but I figured something had to go right after this shitty day. For a moment, I had also considered calling the police, but... I knew that might cause more problems for me in the long run. If Mrs. Lofton found out I did something this monumentally stupid, I could kiss my paycheck goodbye. Instead, I decided to text my girlfriend. Signal is bad now, with the doors closed. I hear a storm approaching. Rex would probably tear up the house while I was down here. I'd hope she can get me out of here. You're locked in the basement? Her response made it sound like she thought it was my fault. Look, I'm not here to tell you the details. Can you help me or what? I don't get off work until after ten. Well, it's not like I'm going anywhere. I slipped the phone into my back pocket and walked up the stairs, attempting again to jiggle the door open. I couldn't hear Rex, but for some reason, I was sure the dog was somewhere nearby. Hey, you stupid dog, my girlfriend's coming by to get me out of here. And you better be nice when she gets here, I muttered. 
I wasn't exactly sure how Denise would even get in the house, but she was resourceful. She had to figure something out, I thought as I gritted my teeth and sat on the steps. First thing I do is lock Rex down here as a payback, I thought sourly, as rain began to pelt the house. I could hear the husky beginning to whine and bark. Storm upset him, just like Mrs. Lofton said it would. Then I heard the sound of glass breaking, and the dog clawing against a door. He was panicking, and so was I. How the hell was I going to fix this mess? I sighed, and I listened as the dog kept destroying the house, and I was powerless to stop him. So much for that pay, I thought. Now get a hold of yourself, Jeff. You, you have three more days. We can figure this out. Finally, it was nearly 10.30 at night. Rex had settled. Denise told me she was on her way, and I listened for her car to pull up. The storm had subsided, too, so I could hear everything that was happening. First, I heard her brakes and the car engine turn off, followed by her calling my name as she opened the front gate. This place is so creepy. Is this dog dangerous? I wasn't sure how to respond to that. Rex had reacted so strongly to the stranger earlier. What if... What if he attacked my girlfriend? Try to hurry. I can't be stuck down here for three more days. Denise texted back that the front door was actually wide open. That's impossible. I locked it. Denise's response wasn't very reassuring. Well, you did say the dog can open and close doors, right? I felt my heart skip a beat as I imagined Rex was off running around somewhere, but I couldn't worry about that. I told her to hurry to the basement. Power's out. I can't see a thing. I listened for her, trying to bang on the door to get her attention. Instead, I heard Rex make a terrible noise. It didn't sound like a dog at all. Denise let out a scream and Rex matched her tone and volume with every decibel. Then I heard the dog bound toward her and I frantically tried to open the door again as I heard my girlfriend fall to the floor. Her screaming continued as I heard the dog barking and snarling. I mean, I knew how vicious this dog could be, and all I could do was try to attract his attention to the basement. Loud banging and crashing filled the air for the next few minutes as Denise valiantly fought the dog. Then finally, the entire house went silent. I held my breath and I waited. Did she win? Did Rex kill her? I reached for my phone and texted her. I heard it softly ping somewhere in the house and I clenched my fist. If that dog had hurt her, I would make sure it never saw the light of day again. Instead, a moment later, the basement door unlatched and it opened. Denise was standing there, covered in scratches and fresh blood. I couldn't do much except for hug her. Then I immediately put my guard up and searched for the dog. Rex was nowhere to be seen. Guiding her to the guest room, I told Denise to stay there while I found the dog and put an end to this. It was still pitch dark, and I knew the husky would probably see me before I saw it. Moved to the den, searching for the fireplace poker. It would have to be a makeshift weapon. I heard a low creaking noise and nearly jumped out of my skin. The front door was open. I ran to the yard, realizing the gate was also open. Rex had escaped. My first thought was good riddance, and then my phone buzzed. Mrs. Lofton. I'm quitting, I told my neighbor. This dog is insane. I got locked in the basement almost all night, and then Rex attacked my girlfriend. As I walked back to the kitchen, the power turned on and the lights flickered. Mrs. Lofton hadn't responded to my announcement, so I asked if she heard me. She claimed that Rex would never hurt anyone. Not her dog. She insisted that I video chat with her, and I sighed in frustration, nearly jumping out of my skin again, when I saw Rex at the end of the hall. There you are, you fucking monster, I said as I pulled out the video chat and walked to the hallway. You see? Rex is covered in my girl's blood, I said, focusing the camera on the husky. I stood by the guest room and unlatched the door, telling Denise that we were leaving. My eyes caught sight of something on the floor. A mess of hair and skin. My blood went cold and... My breath caught in my throat. It looked like a cocoon of flesh. Peeled and dried out as if discarded. What the hell? Mrs. Lofton's face was pale and full of fear, and immediately she told me why. That... that wasn't her dog. 
I looked towards the husky and watched as the dog stood up on his hind legs again. This time its fur began to rescind and become skin. Its face distorted and resembled my girlfriend, naked, still covered in scratches. The fake Denise stepped towards me. Half of her body still in the shape of the monstrous dog. I stumbled into the guest room, realizing the pound of flesh I had seen was what this creature had done to my real girlfriend, and then... I dropped the phone and I ran towards the door. The fake Denise shrieked and bounded towards me, shifting between dog and human as it tried to attack. I made it to my car and revved the engine, the creature standing in the middle of the street as it howled, sounding like a scream and a bark all at once. I pushed down on the pedals and slammed into the creature, flinging it over my windshield and shattering the glass. I didn't look back. I kept driving until I made it home, and finally, finally I caught my breath. The next day, I used my brother's phone and I contacted the police. I tried to tell them everything that I knew that they would believe. They asked me to come to Lofton's residence, so we met around ten that morning. Much to my surprise, Mrs. Lofton had returned home. As the police explained the claim that I had made about Denise, my neighbor gave a confused look. She claimed to not even own a dog. The police searched the residence and found only the old dog food. She said Rex had died a few years ago, and there wasn't much to show that Denise had ever been there. Visibly frustrated, the police left and warned me about making false statements. I stood at the edge of the yard, staring at them in utter defeat, and then... then toward Mrs. Lofton on her porch. She was smiling, waved as they left. And I swear to you, I... I saw something behind her thin frame. The tail wagging. Her eyes shimmered for a second as she stared at me, and... And I immediately drove off. The thing had lured me here, and likely planned to kill me originally before Denise showed up. I told my co-worker to never take the job from her again. And I told myself... I'm never dog-sitting. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Before I tell you all goodnight, I just want to remind you that there is tea available. It hasn't been available for quite a while, but now my wife's tea shop, the Ivory Monocle Tea, has become available once again. If you guys have been missing out on tea or if you've missed out over the holidays, over these crazy, crazy months for me and my family, well, uh, now's your time to get more tea. Head over to Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea and you can get your hands on tea from my wife. It's perfect if you guys happen to be living through this winter storm. <laughs> it's freezing outside. All the trees are frozen over with ice for me. So tea is wonderful this time of year. And hopefully it's wonderful for you once the allergies get started. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on, you guys are the ones who are keeping me sane. And I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. So in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Jeff Vernon, Diana Krauss, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pepper Squeezer, Travis, Joseph Calarudo, Who Would It Be, Dante Kincaid, Foxhound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Ember Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sama High, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Captain Scurvy, Escadine, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Shelly J, Facamel, The Legal Account, Melt the Lake, Polly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Peter Chip, Acid System, Mog, Curious Lot, Buster's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, and Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.